people that like farmers or Native American people, they were so in tune with where they live and they just took time to notice things. And so we're out with our tortoises, you just notice things. They're, they're actually benign and gentle animals. Uh, as you can see, look at this one's gonna just climb right on over me. And using their own ah, <laughs> Okay, so you want to work with probably the most beautiful tortoise that's out there on the market these days, and that is, of course, the radiated tortoise. So if you think you know what it takes to raise a radiated tortoise, well, I got news for you. You're going to learn even more today on this episode of Camp Yannick, one of the rarest species on Earth. Ah, oh, what's going on, guys? We're hanging out here. We got my buddy Al Roach is in town. Look, it's Al. What's there up? he is. Hey, so, you know, it's funny, Al. You actually said that this is a species you'd love to keep about. Actually. Absolutely. Yeah, and now this is, if you're a tortoise keeper, the radiated tortoise is one of the most sought after species. It's uh, kind of what I would consider a marquee species. We also have an aldabra kind of hanging out in here, and that's kind of cool because these tortoises are found in the same part of the world. Of course, the radiated are from Madagascar, uh, the aldabras are from islands off the northeastern coast of Madagascar, the Seychelles Islands. Uh, but uh, we're gonna focus primarily on, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful species. And you'll get a lot of variety uh, with these species. You'll have some that have so many of the radiating lines. Come on down here, this is what gives them their namesake is those radiations, those striations here. Um, some of them are just full of them. Like for example, this one, okay? So collectors who are really interested in the beauty of this species are going to look for the ones that have just a lot of striations, a lot of those radiating uh, lines. There are also some that are almost what we call sunburst, right. uh, where they're very blonde. They have so many of those radiations that the shell has minimal black in it. I personally, I don't care. I just love the fact that they're a mid-sized tortoise. Uh, they are hardy uh, and they're also uh, easy in my opinion to care for um, you know as are any of these full size oh yeah absolutely uh, these are all adults yeah. these are all what you would consider adult tortoises that's an egg laying size um, they can get a bit bigger I believe is that one of my males can you check I think it is let give them a look under the hood there yeah that's one of the males the concave plastron the large tail as opposed to just like other tortoise species, the females are going to have shorter tails and a flatter uh, flatter plastron like this. You can see right here, wait a minute. Yep, that's a little gal. Small tail, flat plastron, but an adult nonetheless. Now, going over um, what makes a healthy tortoise, this is probably common knowledge to some of you, but for those of you who don't know, you want a tortoise when you're looking to purchase one, especially a radiator, you're more than likely gonna be looking at a baby uh, because as babies, these are still a high dollar animal, anywhere from $1,000 to $1,500, depending on the amount of color or those striations in there. Um, you wanna basically look for a young tortoise that's got clear, bright eyes, firm shell, can move around uh, easily. You want to make sure they're mobile um, and active. A lot of times I used to actually sell tortoises. I used to go to the reptile shows and the one thing that always I did well with was the fact that my baby tortoises were moving around. They were eating right at the reptile show. Um, so that right there takes away a lot of the guesswork when you're trying to purchase a new baby tortoise. Same thing uh, for an adult. When you pick up an adult tortoise, say you're gonna buy an adult radiata, you, um, you're gonna pick it up you want, them, you want them to feel heavier right. than they actually appear. Um, it's, it's very important. Same thing, clear, bright eyes, mobility, and look at this, they're eating. Now these guys clearly aren't for sale, but they are actually a tortoise as endangered as they are. There are more of them in the United States than there are in Madagascar. I'm sure. Yeah, which is crazy. Now, um, they are sought after in Asian markets because of their beauty. Uh, so these animals have been kind of smuggled out of Madagascar and we always talk about this Al. Madagascar is such an interesting place. It's a biodiversity hotspot. There are a few of those in the world. Costa Rica is one where you have an, you have basically an area of the world that 
is overrepresented by biodiversity. So it's a small geographic area, but there's so many different animals there. Uh, in Madagascar, Madagascar, you've got um, many different mammal species, many different reptile species. Uh, so it makes it a bio biodiversity hotspot. Unfortunately, uh, this country, this island country, does not have a consistent government. Uh, and so what happens is new governments get thrown in and bigger countries take advantage of their natural resources. So right now, China has been really getting into uh, Africa and uh, Madagascar and they are really you know, making their presence felt because they're able to extract a lot of minerals and you know, uh, natural resources. Well, consider these animals natural resources. Um, so it's very sad and the people there in Madagascar don't make tons of money. In fact, uh, they, a dollar a day is about the going rate for salary there. So when you get people that have these beautiful tortoises living in their country, they will collect them and try and smuggle them out. And in the last 10 years, there have been a couple of confiscations that showed people, uh, showed about 10,000 animals in one, uh, one confiscation, 10,000 of these tortoises. So that represents probably uh, a quarter of the animals that are actually in the country still. So they are extremely endangered in the wild. But as I said, here in the United States, they started coming in uh, in the 70s and 80s. And they have been kind of reproduced here in the United States. Uh, and we have, they're well represented here. How much this, do the adults go for? I almost don't want to say, but the adults, uh, adult females can be $15,000, $20,000 in that range for a very large adult. So, um, you know, you will have people try and steal them and then smuggle them out of the United States. Uh, so that's why we have the security we have around here. We've got the cameras, we've got electric fences, we've got everything in place to minimize uh, that happening. Um, it's, it's something that you really have to be careful of. Uh, but the reality is it's not worth trying to take them here in the United States because uh, people have been smuggling them out of Madagascar and you get a cheaper animal. You know, sadly, people will pay way less for a smuggled animal. So to care for them now, now that you know some backstory on the animals, caring for them, to be perfectly honest, it's kind of easy. Oh, sure. Yeah, these are a grassland species. These are a browsing species. And what I have done here for you guys is I'm showing you some of the plants that I grow that these tortoises love to eat. So we've got, of course, the paddle cactus. This is a spineless Apuntia cactus. Um, very good food for these animals and grows here at the camp or in Florida in southeastern United States very easily. You can also purchase this stuff at Latin supermarkets because in Mexico they call it nopales and they actually eat it. It's actually good for you. It's good for digestion. It's similar uh, to an aloe vera. Uh, it's good for your bodies and these guys love it because uh, not only is it good for their digestion, it also hydrates them. There's a lot of moisture in this and we call that preform water. It's water that they're able to take out of another organism and use in their own body. <laughs> <laughs> they have strong beaks and uh, they hurt. Look at that. So that little guy got me. That's about the worst bite I've ever got, which is good because people often ask me, uh, do they bite? And they don't go out of their way to bite you. But if you aren't fast enough in getting the cactus in their little beaks, you're going to get it. And boy, did I just get it. Uh, they could potentially break the skin, especially when they're super excited about eating. Uh, you bit my finger, you little one there. At least it wasn't one of your Aldabras. Yeah, that would have <laughs> hurt even worse. Uh, I'd probably lose a fingertip. But anyhow, that was, uh, that'll wake you up in the morning. And uh, they're, they're actually benign and gentle animals. Uh, as you can see, look at this one's gonna just climb right on over me. Um, but. They know me, they come over when I have food. Here comes another one who smelled the food, saw the commotion. There's another one that's woken up and it's making its way over here. Uh, I really enjoy keeping them because of their beauty, but mostly because of their personalities. They're really incredible animals. Um, as babies, they're no, less, uh, no more difficult than any other young species. In fact, I'd put these guys on par with sulcatas as far as their hardiness. Yeah. About the only thing that's difficult is the fact that you know, sulcatas, they'll lay a bunch of eggs and you'll get a 90% hatch rate. With the, um, the, the radiateds, they don't lay as many eggs. A big female is going to lay about five eggs. And then, to be honest, their fertility rate isn't that great. Now, a lot of that has to do with the fact that... Look, he's scratching his butt. 
Scratching your butt. Scratching your butt. Scratch that butt. This is how you drive a tortoise crazy. Give them little scratches on their hindies. They can feel through their shells. But anyway, what I was saying about the eggs is the eggs are kind of special because you have to do what's called a diapause. So what we do is we pull the eggs, and this is from my friends Kurt uh, Harbsmeyer and Colette Adams. Uh, Colette's from the uh, Gladys Porter Zoo, and she basically has figured out how to really do well with hatching radiated tortoises. She'll keep the eggs uh, for 24 to 48 hours in the refrigerator. She cools them down. Then she pulls them out, lets them uh, sit for another 24 hours in room temperature, and then puts them in the incubator. And this diapause, this uh, cooling off period, triggers the egg to start the embryo production. So once you do that, they incubate for about five months and then you will get a baby. That's pretty tricky to pull off. It's it? very, it's, in my opinion it is. It's not as simple as pulling them out of the ground and throwing them in the incubator. Although I know people that do that as well, but Colette has had the best um, performance or the best hatch rates uh, by doing her method of diapausing. And so diapause is basically a suspension or a trigger of uh, of development in the embryo. Now, some are triggered by temperature, others are triggered by moisture. So they'll lay the eggs, but the eggs don't develop until there is a rain. They start to develop because what does nature want? Nature wants the baby to start out its life in the absolute best, uh, best scenario. So if it's being triggered by the wet season to start developing, that means there's gonna be a lot of food plentiful. Um, when they hatch, uh, it'll usually be the end of the wet and these animals will then have lots of food to browse on and eat. So as you can see here, we've got the cactus, we've got mulberry leaves, we've also got our fluker uh, prepared foods. They'll eat a wide variety of easily uh, accessible foods here. Our fluker food, that's the uh, gourmet tortoise blend. It's got their tortoise sticks as well as some yellow squash, dehydrated squash, dehydrated pepper, and dehydrated carrot. Um, you can moisten it and rehydrate it or you can eat it as uh, they can eat it as long as they have access to water, uh, which will in, you know, help it uh, expand in their guts and they can break it down and digest. Like how often do you need to feed them like when they're young? When they're young, I like to feed baby tortoises. I have a rule of thumb. You can feed them a little bit every day. I'd feed them uh, about as much food as they are big. Just put that much food in the enclosure. If they're this big, that much food and let them eat that. Uh, or you can do larger feedings once every other day. That's generally what I do. What do you do with your tortoises as hatchlings? I got a problem. I feed mine every single day. Yeah, no, that's okay. <laughs> I mean, some yeah. people do that, but you know, I tend to like, you know, I like slow, steady growth with my tortoise, my baby tortoises. I just feel that overall, um, slow and steady, like Aesop's fable, is the best thing for the right. tortoises. But, um, you know, I've met a lot of keepers like Al. Uh, they'll, they'll get size on their animals quickly. Um, I just don't do that. So, uh, and it's, it has a lot to do with the fact that I, you know, not that you don't have a lot to take care of, but you know, you can rotate feedings of the yeah. babies off from when you're feeding the adults, or you can do it all in one foul swoop. But um, as far as water, they need, um, you know, a fresh water source close to them. We have the aquascape ponds here. We shut the, we actually shut the waterfall off so you guys can hear me talk, but we have constantly circulating water here. Um, and we have that stream. If you look over there, you can see the stream. Uh, and the stream itself is awesome because the tortoises really enjoy going into it. They drink from it. It's fresh water. It's always moving. That's important. I've never had any problems with the tortoises going in the deep water, but they do like to soak in the stream when the stream is running. So I think that's important. So you can kind of do something different by having a shallow saucer pan, uh, a clay uh, flower pot base is a perfect for a large tortoise. You can get a smaller one for a baby tortoise. Sometimes those can be deep, but if you take pebbles, a little bit of gravel, some, some kind of aquarium substrate, you put it in there and you can decrease the depth of the water. You can also decrease it just by not filling it up as to capacity. Uh, it's important to mind that because baby tortoises can flip over and drown sometimes. I've had that happen. So you don't want them to flip over in their water bowl. But they are really fantastic species because of their hardiness. It's funny, you think endangered, you think rare, you think they're delicate. That's not the case with the radiated tortoise. Uh, these guys enjoy uh, pretty much everything that we have down here in Florida as far as temperatures. Um, in the winter, we have cooler temperatures and I don't worry about them until it gets below 60. 
and that's when I make sure they're in a uh, heated shelter or I rake a bunch of leaves into a pile and the tortoises tend to go into it. Up north, you're gonna wanna make sure they have a basking area with full spectrum UVB that gets between 95 and 105 degrees. I like to put a flat rock under the light that heats up from the bottom as well. The tortoises will move into it, lay on it, raise their body temperature, and then you're gonna wanna see them moving around. When you see a tortoise of any size, just basking all the time or staying in the cool side of the enclosure all the time, then you know you have a tortoise that may have some kind of underlying health issue. As far as a ambient temperature for these animals, you wanna look for about 85, 80 to 85 degrees. Uh, nighttime temperature drops into the 70s are acceptable. Uh, they function very well. And the reason we want these tortoises to have the higher temperatures or a good ambient temperature is because they're like all tortoises and uh, vegetarian, uh, Chelonians or lizards, they're hindgut fermenters. They have long intestines. The food stays in their bellies for a long time. They're eating foods like these plants and roughage that take a long time to break down. So they have the long intestines that go to work on that food. And basically you want to keep the temperatures constant for them to maintain homeostasis and their metabolism. So that's very important. You don't want them to get too cold, especially if they're being fed. These are not a species so that hibernate. It's a little trickier if you're keeping them up north. If you're keeping really them up north, it's, it's you know, it's not really that tricky because so many of you guys have tortoises up north, um, but you want to just make sure if you're a beginner, you want to make sure you've got your fluker heating lights and uh, other products that they can help you with. Like I said, full spectrum UVB for tortoises is paramount as they need the UVB to synthesize vitamin D uh, and keep them healthy. You can feed them all day long, but if they don't have, you can feed them the right foods all day long, but if they don't have that full spectrum UVB lighting, then you've got no way for them to absorb the vitamins that they're actually intaking. Um, getting them outside during the warmer months of the year is important. You'll notice they'll put on a lot of sides, they'll be able to graze. These are animals that love to walk around and nibble on grasses and weeds and other sorts of vegetation. They will eat fruit from time to time. What I like to do is when the mangoes are in season, the mangoes drop, I let them gorge on the mangoes because it's seasonal. They don't eat it all the time but it is a good source of water and hydration for them. And it's a treat, they get excited. It's sweet, tastes good. Another uh, good fruit is melon, watermelon, high water content, but avoid really, really citrusy foods. They won't like that. Uh, you don't wanna do apple or anything. Uh, stick with your melons uh, and cantaloupe and things like that, uh, which will be a much better source of moisture and treat for those animals. Hey, I ain't gonna get mad at you if you feed them a blueberry or a strawberry every now and again, but too much sugar can affect their hind gut and it can give them a bout of diarrhea. And that's true of all grassland species, of all tortoises that do a lot of browsing. So that goes for your sulcatas, leopards, your Greeks, your, uh, your Hermans tortoises, all those tortoises that tend to be really uh, involved in eating foods like this yeah, that are high in fiber. You said grassland species, what about substrate? Yeah, substrate, so that's a great point. There used to be grass here, but they've denuded it. Um, you can see now, uh, there's a, it's a sandy kind of wood chippy mixture. Um, I am gonna be doing a fresh bit of mulch on this. I like to throw down the mulch. We use actually great big large bags, uh, large bales of reptibark from Fluker. Uh, that's not something that people can do in a large enclosure, most people. So grass is good. You can have some kind of rock substrate as long as the rocks are big enough that they cannot eat. Um, be, if you can keep them on grass, for example, if you have maybe uh, a smaller group of animals but a larger space, you'll be able to keep grass growing. Here, the grass got eaten up. I throw hay down for them. Uh, they'll burrow into the hay and leaves. But yeah, substrate in captivity. I like to use potting soil mixed with a little bit of sand. And then on top of that, you're putting some reptile bark, uh, repta bark, because that'll be a nice top layer. And if the tortoises want to dig what's called a pallet, where they kind of nestle in for the night, it kind of keeps them warm, but it's also a microclimate. There's humidity under there. Uh, if you're keeping them indoors, it's okay to give them a little bit of a squirt with some water during the, uh, maybe two times a week. You wanna moisten the lower portions of the substrate. You could just take some water, pour it into their enclosure. It'll settle on the bottom, disperse itself amongst the substrate, and then the tortoises can dig down into it and it provides them with what they need as far as humidity around their bodies. I think that's always a good way to do it. Also in their hides, do some sphagnum moss, moisten 
scrunched out and then you have damp sphagnum moss in some of their hides. It's just always good. It's good for their shell development, things like that. How long have you uh, had this group at Radio? Uh, this group, uh, there are three that are my personal animals and then uh, the rest of them are a buddy of mine's who I've been holding on to for many years. Um, it's kind of a breeding loan. Uh, basically, I've had these uh, for about 10 years now, living here at the camp. They were adults when I got them. Some of these animals were, were brought into the United States in the 1980s as adults. Wow. Others were raised up by my buddy. And um, they're just, again, fantastic animals. They've been with me now for a while. I have just nothing but good things with them because they are so easy to care for um, and they're beautiful you know that one over there is pretty unique with that higher dome yeah yeah that's that's cool there is, is there some variation kind of story behind that one you know just the fact that i guess um you know she does have this really high domed shell um almost like the stereotypical tortoise right like that real cool almost like a unifera right, like yeah, you yeah. see the another madagascar species um the bowsprit, no, not bowsprit, the, the, plowshare. Uh, the plowshare tortoise, yeah. thank you. Bowsprits are from South, uh, South Africa. But anyway, the plowshare, but they're very tall domed animals. But you'll notice it is, it is a domed shell, but some are a little bit flatter, like the male here, a little bit flatter and elongated. Um, but yeah, I don't know, it's just variation. It's like, um, you know, uh, they, they all have just a little bit, little bit differences. I don't know if it's a locality from Madagascar or if it's just a one-off, but very interesting, and yes. And also, if you look at her skin, uh, much more yellow and less black in her skin. Mm -hmm. um, and some of these put off some really beautiful um, light babies, which is kind of unique, you know, when I do get the babies. Unfortunately, I don't have any babies to show you. We do have some eggs incubating. Um, and then, you know, it's worth having a look around. You can kind of see the enclosure. Um, very important, and this is true of any tortoise species, okay? You're gonna want to plant it with grasses that they can kind of get under and hide in. So we've got areas along the enclosure here where you can see they'll nestle in. It provides cover during the hotter part of the day. When they go to bed, they always find something to nestle into, whether it's grass, go up against a rock or a fence. They kind of dig these pallets. Uh, they're flat little dishes that dig out with a pretty good length. sized burrow. You want to know the funny thing about that burrow? A lot of you have watched this all the time. Timmy, right there, the Aldabra, He's kind of been using it. Uh, yeah, which you don't think of them as a burrowing species, but if there is something that's already crafted for them, they'll make use of Did it. Did a Sokata start that? No, that's right. no, no, it's just been there, man. Yeah. But like, you can kind of look around and see how, I've tried to keep most of it open because they like full sun. They really, really do well with, you know, it's a very, where they're from in Madagascar is dry, uh, not quite desert, but dry brush, um, you know, maybe dry forest. So that's where they're living. And uh, you know, that's what I tried to replicate here. You notice that this is on a slope, yeah. water yeah. runs off. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't inundate it, doesn't get real soggy it's here. Egg -like. Yeah, that's what we're looking for. So I found eggs all along, but like other tortoises, they tend to want to lay up against objects, whether it's a plant or a fence or a rock. So I found this was actually a nice grass that's gone now. But yeah, you can sometimes find eggs little poking around I don't know I you know this I don't want to spend burrowed there earlier right? yeah I don't want to spend too much time because I really don't know if there are any eggs available now at you the think moment. any of them are gonna be able to hatch naturally here right? I have had that really that's a great question yeah wow. it's cool when you have another turtle nerd this is what we ask each other I was walking around and I look on the ground and I go it's a baby radiated so um, yeah, they have hatched in the ground here. And was there more to the clutch? I looked, it was just one. So I was really excited about that. But yeah, like I found him up over by the water. And so like all, you know, they're gonna live near a water source. Uh, if they can find one, that's always, you know, let me put you here. This is kind of a cool area to lay eggs. You gotta think, look at this, come here. Look at this, this looks like a nest that was dug, but I don't, it looks like it was dug up. But this did feel, you could just kind of, you get to know, like that's yep. kind of what you're looking for. Like they'll cover it and then you'll just see like uh, disturbed soil. Yeah, I walk in my turtle enclosures all the time and I just can come up and say, oh, turtle laid there. You can just tell. It's weird. It's like, yeah. you know, I always liken it to the fact that people that like farmers or, or Native American people, they were so in tune with where they lived uh, and they just took time to notice 
things. And so we're out with our tortoises, you just notice things, you know, you become uh, more in tune with everything going on around you. And uh, Tom Crutchfield, uh, who you guys know, uh, a guy that I just have gotten a wealth of information from, he and I bonded because uh, he's like, if people just shut up and just watch their animals, you'll they'll teach you everything you need to know and i was like that's what i do i always say just sh just watch your animals get out there with them you know get out in the habitat and just walk around and you know really enjoy them and spend time with them and then you'll watch where they lay you'll notice little telltale signs um you know all these leaves here great cover for babies you know so i let the leaves accumulate but yeah like i walk around here's a pallet we were talking about a pallet, a form. Uh, uh, it's a little depression. And there'll be a tortoise that'll come over here and just kind of look around. My finger hurts because it got bit. Um, I don't know if you guys, do you guys remember that where I said a bad word? I apologize to all the moms out there whose children had to hear me say the, uh, the, the bad poopy word. But so back that hurt. Back to the babies. Back to the babies. What what do you normally get that per year egg wise? Uh, I, you know, it's been a little random this year. I'll get, Probably, you know, that I find, because it's a large area, right. maybe like 10, 12, you know, I'm not getting a, a, a great deal. And then the, I just don't have the best luck with the diapause and stuff, you know? I get babies, but they're not, it's not like a sulcata where you're getting like 90% hatch rate, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, I like to look around. Um, you know, I kind of check around, you know, you, I, the baby I found out was over here, just walking around. Uh, so it's just, it's crazy. I got a question. This is their shelter, right? Yeah, they, this is one of them. Yeah, I, I actually, uh, I've been pulling them into a larger shelter. But yeah, I'll look in here. Look, there we got core ambienensis Asian there. Asian box turtle. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes you, you wonder if babies or, or tortoises will go in there as well. But will they go put themselves away? They, in are, not, or? they are not like the redfoots or sulcatas, which tend to, they seem to be smarter. Like they just know where to go in for the evening. These guys find the nearest place under a branch, or under like leaves or under uh, grass, and they just park it right there. And even the turtles. Yeah. Well, we got Caligars. Yeah, we got Caligar. Well, Badiger now. Badiger, yeah. Badiger, right? Yeah, some Caligar. But yeah, so they're pretty cool. But I've never found any of the baby tortoises in water or the large ones. They tend to be very smart, and they just drink from the stream, or they'll go up and drink from that area. But I mean, that is about as comprehensive of a radiated tortoise video as I think you'll find on the interwebs, on the internet, on the tube. And uh, not only that, we had Al with us. Um, What's up? It's Al. <laughs> but I think we did a good job here today. Um, I hope you guys are happy. Let me know in the comments below, is this a species you guys want to keep? I'd love to hear from you. Do you have radiated? Did I miss something in my long-winded um, diatribe about radiated tortoises. Let me know in the comments below, how do you do it? How do you hatch these guys? Do you hatch them? I wanna know. And in addition to that, why don't you also do me a big favor? Head on over to patreon.com slash campkenneth and become a patron today. Help us keep helping all of you out there make really good, fun reptile content so we can all learn something. All right, guys, thanks so much. Say, see you later, Al. See ya. No, I meant, you guys say see you later, Al. Oh, okay. Al, say goodbye. They just say goodbye. You, All right, we'll see you guys later. So long, everybody.